Our God is faithful. This past week, we've been in prayer that God would turn hurricanes into storms or steer them away. And lo and behold, it happened. But even more so, even if we got hit by hurricanes, God is still faithful. That we are people that are called by the grace of God to do life together. In the midst of storms of life, whether they be real or figurative, we are here together. And thanks be to God that the hurricanes decided to go somewhere else other than Oahu. And so today, may we celebrate that realization together. And your bulletin is an aloha pink take-home work. Uh, this week, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to study a genre of the Psalms. Uh, it's the Psalms of the Pilgrims, or the Ascent Psalms. And so we're going to take you through those for the next six days to learn about what Israel would say as they're preparing to go to the holy place, Jerusalem, and what they would be reciting together. So take that, put it in your pocket or your purse, and that way you can go deeper uh, this week. Would you pray with me as we begin our sermon this morning? <clears> o <throat> Spirit of God, fall afresh on us. Give us ears to hear. Give us a willingness to receive. Give us the courage to become that which you create us to be. And so move among us and move within us. For the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. Over the course of this sermon series, my hope is that we look at the crossroads that have been found, some in our scriptures. There are many, but looking at some of the major ones. Because what we find is that you and I are always in the midst of crossroads. We're either entering into a new crossroad, living in the midst of one, or exiting, preparing for a new crossroads. In the last few weeks, we've looked at some of the big, big stories of our faith. The guy named Abram, who's called to just go, and God would tell him when to stop. And in the 15th chapter of Genesis, he's given a covenant, a promise, that God would make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. seashore. And also what that promise was that the land that he was standing on would one day be the promised land for the people. Last week we saw Israel at their amazing movement of God standing in the desert at a crossroads. Do we trust the scouts, the spies that have spied out this promised land and do we go or do we stay? Last week we discovered that we have a choice to make at crossroads. And Israel from the 83% of the spies that said, don't go into that land. There's giants there. The people for 40 years were stuck in that land. They're always stuck on the edge of the Jordan River. And across the Jordan is the land of promise. And for 40 years, they watched it, but never lived into it. Today, we turn the page, and we turn to a whole new section of our scriptures, starting with the story of Joshua. You'll recall from last week, Joshua is one of the 12 spies. He and Caleb had this belief that no matter how big the giants are in the promised land, they aren't too big for our God. If that's the land God's promised to us, then it will be so. And yet they tried to stone them. Fast forward 40 years and we come to this place of hope. Moses has died, and the descendants, those that didn't believe in the promise and the call to go to promised land, died in wilderness, always looking over at what could be, but never living into what was to be theirs. A new generation has risen, their sons and daughters. They've been in this wilderness, most of them born there, hearing about this land that flows with milk and honey, a land of abundance, a place in which God dwells, in which they're called to be inhabitants. And for 40 years, they've lived in desert. They lived in wilderness, and the moment has come. 
Have you ever been on that cusp of crossing the Jordan in your life? A dream that's becoming a reality. A hope that you've hoped for for so long that it's finally tangible. And what is our response? What I found most often, it's fear. It's fear. There's this amazing thing that we have as people. We have this ability to dream and hope and create plans. But when the door opens, so often we stop. We stop at the threshold of promise. Why? Because where we are right now is, is what we know. We're comfortable in it. We've become accustomed to this land in which we dwell. And the amazing thing to me of all the years I've been in ministry is how many people are stuck and they see the promised land, but they never take a step into it. What they find is that at least I understand where I am. I know what to expect. But if I take a step and follow through, I may not know what happens in my future. And that's too scary for me to handle. Or we step over the bank of the Jordan and what we find is that the dream was better than the reality that we've walked into. If we've done that enough times, then we're too scared to walk into dreams because we're afraid to be let down. Or what we realize is that when we step into a new reality, it means that we have to start dreaming again. That there's an unknown future in front of us. And we have to put ourselves to the task of living into the unknown and trusting in that which we yet see. And so for many people, wilderness, no matter how bad it is, is better than the unknown. That's why I'm always surprised when I talk with battered individuals. They're either physically abused or emotionally abused in their homes. They would rather stay there then take a leap of faith and go there. Because at least they know and are comfortable in the midst of their pain. Central Union Church is a church that is old. None of us were here when it started. And none of us are going to be here in many generations from now. It's a church that has been very full and at other times have ebbed down to a few. It's a church that has stood against injustice in our community. At other times, it's been a church that is focused inward to survive. My feeling, and this is just one person, is that we're at the bank again. And there is a promised land over there. We talked about last week, and this week the challenge for us is to hear the good news through Joshua's story. To go there is going to be scary. To go there means that some of us might actually have to change. To go there means that some of us might have to step up instead of sit down. To go there means that Central Union Church may actually have to come back together as a people instead of silos. To go to the promised land means that you and I have to give up this wilderness of our existence to live into the promise of tomorrow. And so we turn to our scriptures for inspiration. We turn to Joshua as he is invited to lead the Israelites. Now he's no longer a young man. When he first went to the promised land, he was quite young. But now he's an older man. He's given the task to lead and to go. And isn't it interesting that there's a repetitive phrase, did you hear it when it was read? Be strong and courageous. The words fear not or don't be afraid are used some 130 times in our scripture. There's a reason. Is to follow the way of God is scary. Too often we say, just follow the way of God and life is hunky-dory and easy. No. 
To follow the way of God is to give up the comforts of myself and to open myself up to something much bigger than I could ever do alone. And so whenever angels appear, whenever a bush is on fire, whenever a teenager is told you're pregnant, the resounding phrase of our scriptures is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Israel. And so today we look at what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us to not be afraid, but instead to walk with courage and strength into our future? There's this thing that lurks on the other side of courage and strength, and the word is fear. We talked briefly about it last week, that fear is found in rumors that gets started to stop moving forward. Fear is this powerful entity that we use in our lives. And fear always leads us away from faith. Fear always leads us away from faith. Fear tells us no, whereas faith always tells us yes. Fear tells us about giants. Whereas faith tells us about the bigness of our God. Who are those giants to stand before our God? And so today, I invite you into faith. To be brave and strong. Or strong and courageous. General George Patton once said, Courage is fear that has said its prayers. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. You and I are invited to walk in courage. And so, if you want, you can open up to Joshua 1. And I'm going to teach you how to read the Bible like us seminarians do. There's this criticism, which isn't a criticism per se, but it's a form of reading and understanding our scriptures called textual criticism. Textual criticism is the idea that in our text, in each chapter, in each book, there is a theme that is being driven. And that all this builds upon itself in order to capture the theme of our scriptures. And so the authors, sometimes many authors, depending on the book, or a single author, is trying to lead people to a specific place. And so the first five books are called the Pentateuch, the Law. And these are the books that teach us what it means to be God's people and how we began. Now we enter the story of Joshua, the sixth book of the Old Testament. In textual criticism, what you look for are recurring themes or contrasts. And so contrasts give you a point, right? Abraham was 75 years old when he's told to go. When he is told he's going to be a daddy, how old is he? A hundred Textual criticism tells you that the actual age doesn't matter. It's the craziness of the idea that you should pay attention to. That God does the miraculous. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 9 is the use of a textual criticism or textual uh, unique way of telling a story by repeating phrases multiple times. How many of you have ever been told, take out the trash? Take out the trash. Take out the trash. What is the message of that phrase? Take out the trash. How many times in our scripture does it admonish us to love God, to love God, to love God, to love God? Or to love others, love others, love others, love others. The repeatedness of this phrase is supposed to make a point in you and me that we should do it. It's not a novel idea. That's what we are. We're called to love God, love others, and take out the trash. Amen? Amen. And so this repeated phrase, be strong and courageous, is used three times. And it gives us a key to understanding what is happening in the life of Israel and what Joshua's call is in this place. Starting at verse 6. Be brave and strong because you are the one who will help this people take possession of that land, the promised land which I pledge to give to their ancestors. 
All these folks are new generation Israelites. They've heard the story of God's miracles and God's covenant with his people. And now Joshua is told, be strong and courageous and lead them into this land to possess it. Why is that important? It's a promise that was given. Some hundreds of years before Joshua takes on leadership. A promise that is given to Abraham and is reestablished with each generation. That I'm going to take you to this land called promise. Where you're going to flourish. It's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. And so they're invited to go. The land that they enter is exactly the land that was always promised. The promise never changed. Just the people's willingness to trust the promise changed. The promise never changed. Just the people's willingness to do it. Is that true in our lives? Yes. God's promises don't change, but our willingness to trust them does. And so the courage and strength that we need is to go, to live into the promises of God, and to trust that God will see through it. Verse 7. Be very brave and strong, or be strong and very courageous. As you carefully obey all the instruction that Moses, my servant, commanded you, don't deviate even a bit from it, either to the right or to the left. Then you will have success wherever you go. Jesus is asked by some scholars, what is the greatest command of all the commands of our scriptures? And if you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard it, to love God and to love others. It's not a new idea. Jesus is reciting the Shema. The Shema, Shema means hear, as in hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The Shema is out of Deuteronomy 6. So grab a pencil or pen and write down Deuteronomy 6. It's your homework today. To read Deuteronomy 6. It's one of the key things to understanding Israel. Is that they're supposed to recite it. In fact, put it on their doorposts. So that when they walk through the door, they remember. When they sit down or when they stand up, they're supposed to recite the law. When they are gathering to eat or going out to play basketball, they're supposed to recite the law. That whatever they do, they're called to remember. Remember to love God and remember to love others. Remember the God of our covenant. He is faithful and will never let us down. And so what does Jesus do? He recites the Shema, but then on the last night, he sits at a table. He invites us to a meal of remembrance. Why? Because we too quickly forget we too quickly forget that God is faithful. We too quickly forget that God is loving. We too quickly forget that we are his beloved children. And so the Shema is something that we recite. Love God, love each other. And remember so that we never forget who we are and whose we are. And then finally in verse 9, I commanded you to be strong and courageous, haven't I? Don't be alarmed or terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I don't know where any of you are on life's journey. Some of you may be the first time in a church. Some of you may have been here forever in a day. But the reality is that no matter how far you run from God, there is God. That no matter what you think you've done that's unforgivable or is so bad that you aren't lovable, God is there. 
no matter what you ever do, God is with you. And God is with Central Union Church. And God is with Olivet Baptist right over there. God is with his people. And too often we forget that. God is with you right now. Wherever you are on life's journey. And so what is the hope of this part of our scriptures? We're called to go. Joshua has given the orders, go to the promised land and get ready. Just like I was with Moses, remember Moses? Remember how the people wanted to vote for a new leader? Remember when the people voted against him and did things against him? Don't worry, he survived. I'm with you. And not only with you, Joshua, I'm with your people. And you're going to walk into a promised land with giants in that land. And don't be afraid. And now remember, remember God's people. Remember what God has done in our past and our ancestors. That same God is the God that's here today. This promised land that we're going into, this is the promise of God. So remember God when you get there. And lastly, never forget. God is with you. Wherever you go, God is with you. May that be true of us. May we listen closely to the call of God at Central Union. God is stirring something new here. And we're going to start walking towards it. And we're going to go inch by inch Hawaiian time. I'm learning. But we're going to have this amazing, amazing future together. That we've lived in wilderness long enough. Aren't you excited to get to the land of promise? I am. I've dreamed of it my whole life. And I've come to this promised isle of a land in which people love each other in spite of each other because it's the aloha spirit. I've come to a land in which we believe that God isn't done yet into a church that has plenty of space for all. into a time in our story in which this new generation, you, take heed to God's call and we go. And is it going to be scary? Yes. And so may the words that are given to Joshua take residence in us. Central Union Church, Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous, for God has called us to go dwell in the land of promise. Let's go. Amen.